Thanks so much for coming. Um, I'll be telling you about DNA microscopy, which is a technology that I've been developing for the past few years that captures spatial and genetic information within a single measurement. And uh, you know, we heard a great talk before about uh, spatial and genetic measurements. Um, and, and so to some extent, I think the, the, the motivation has already been given, but just that I think giving a little bit more kind of a, a broad survey of, of, of at least the way that I see uh, uh, these forms of measurements why and what are, are, are spatial genetics? So, um, <laughs> the, uh, so when we perform uh, spatial genetic measurements in biology, generally we're talking about measurements that lie uh, along two independent axes. On the one hand, it's possible for us to get very little of either type of information. So that's uh, typified by uh, the, uh, you know, the, the common uh, uh, bands on a gel uh, example, in which what we have are, are basically uh, sets of analytes that we know what we're looking for, and we're asking what on average is the amount of a particular analyte or set of analytes that we're interested in. And uh, what flow cytometry has done previously is it's kind of brought that question of, of averages uh, of, of small numbers of analytes to the level of cellular distributions. And so uh, when we look at the flow cytometry chart, what we're looking at is basically just the distribution of a particular set of molecules that we believe are biologically meaningful. And then what, what light microscopy does is it takes this even further and asks how are these uh, cells that we're measuring again with very small numbers of analytes, how, how, uh, you know, how are they distributed spatially and how, how do cells fit together? And meanwhile, we can gravitate to the opposite end of this plot and discard all spatial information ent entirely and instead focus in just on genomic information. And so that's certainly the case when we look at, for example, a genome atlas, or in this case, a cancer genome atlas. What we're asking is, at a particular genomic locus, what is the sequence that on average characterizes that locus? Um, and a lot of the spatial, I'm sorry, this, uh, single cell genomics technologies that have been developed over the past few years uh, have aimed to really take this level of high um, detailed uh, genetic data and bring it to the level, again, of cellular distributions. And so again, we're just like in the case of moving from um, bands on a gel to flow cytometry data, we're moving along to the right of this chart and we're getting more and more spatial data. And so this is where spatiogenetics situates, uh, is at the interface between these two different types of data. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, uh, sort of ways of, of how to get here that, uh, that involve uh, statistical imputation or extrapolation more generally. And, and, and we saw a really beautiful example of this in the previous talk in which under certain simplifying assumptions regarding the correspondence between genetic, uh, uh, cor uh, genetic distance and spatial distance, uh, you can get information about how uh, certain samples partition in space. Another way of getting there uh, to this part of the, uh, of the plot is uh, to build specialized equipment. And that's kind of typified by building an entire sequencer, say, around an individual sample. And that's, you know, it's labor intensive. Certainly, you know, it requires a lot of overhead, but just that it's still um, an option. Um, and DNA microscopy uh, falls in here basically as a way uh, to basically avoid either the statistical extrapolation assumptions or specialized equipment. Um, uh, and instead try to get large amounts of, of highly detailed sequence and uh, spatial data uh, basically as part of a standalone chemical reaction without any specialized equipment uh, on idiosyncratic samples. And uh, I'll be telling you a little bit more about what I mean by idiosyncratic samples, uh, but su suffice it to say that, that there are in fact uh, areas of biology which need to be addressed by this. And, and, and so uh, DNA microscopy sort of offers unique advantages in specific cases in biology where you need to be able to address very idiosyncratic patterns that can't be addressed by uh, either imputation and, and for which you would want to have sort of a, a specialized equipment free method to interrogate them. So what are the cases in biology in which uh, we have a very complex uh, spatial and genetic uh, 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 signatures? One of them, and my favorite one, is, is the adaptive immune system, which is very near and dear to my heart because I spent my PhD work working on it. And in the adaptive immune system, B cells and T cells, which are the active immune cells within the adaptive immune system, make these things called immune receptors. And immune receptors are basically function in sort of microcosms of, of uh, natural selection in which the organism will uh, actively randomize the variability of these of these uh, receptors uh, in order to fine tune their specificity to pathogens. And they do this normally by three particular processes of, of active randomization, one of which is by rearranging individual segments of the genome, 
uh, in a process called VDJ recombination. The second is through uh, basically the randomization of nucleotides between these genomic segments, and this is through a process known as non-homologous end joining. And then finally, they also randomize their sequences using uh, just point mutation. And, and, be, and because the entire backbone of, of the antibody gene is prone to uh, mutation, uh, therefore the potential diversity of these receptors grows astronomically. And so um, this is a very complex genetic system. However, it's also very complex in space. And these are great examples of the way in which that's true. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, a lymph node, or more specifically, a germinal center within a mouse lymph node. And uh, in lymph nodes, B cells and T cells and these other cells, follicular dendritic cells, basically perform a choreographed dance in which they're sort of co-stimulating and, 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 and trying to recognize similar sets of molecules. And if they do, in fact, recognize similar sets of molecules, they'll co-stimulate and wind up inducing each other to proliferate, um, specifically the B cells and T cells. And so that's what we're talking about when we talk about kind of a microcosm of natural selection. That's the situation in which this is certainly true. So you have subsets of cells that are recognizing specific pathogens, and if they recognize them successfully, they'll wind up dividing very, very quickly. And the more important point is that the interactions between these cells are what govern whether or not they'll succeed in, uh, in, in, in basically providing an, a robust immune response. The second example down here is in the tumor microenvironment, which is particularly important for the development of things like antibody immunotherapies. And there, what you're looking at are immune cells that are infiltrating into tumors and, and basically uh, either responding or not responding, depending on the, uh, the cues that they're getting from their environment. And understanding this better and being able to have a way to, in kind of high throughput, interrogate samples where you have this very, very interesting interface between immune cells that have unique genotypes and tumor cells that might also have unique genotypes and might never have existed in the history of the world, both of these cells together, their interactions are what govern the system. And so our, our, our ability to be able to look at idiosyncrasies within samples like this really determines our ability to understand the biology that's involved. But the uh, types of, of systems that involve this sort of complex interplay between space and genetics don't end with the immune system. Another great example of how this uh, you know, becomes important is in the central nervous system. And in the central nervous system, there are other uh, sets of genes called protocadherins that also are, uh, are, are involved in basically endowing individual cells with unique molecular identities. And the way in which they do this is basically by providing combinatorial sets of expression that allow neurons to recognize cell, self and non-self. So every single neuron in your body um, basically expresses what, a, a certain combination of these product adherents. And as they branch out, any, as any individual neural process branches out, it will interrogate the surfaces of other neurons that it interacts with. And if it recognizes that the other neuron that it's interacting with is expressing the, is expressing the same combination of product adherent isoforms, it will not connect to that and, and basically by recognizing that it's able to avoid short-circuiting. And in specifically, in cases where this system fails, you have uh, basically the neural processes basically uh, clumping. And, uh, and, and, the, and, and the failure of the system also seems to be implicated in neuropathologies such as autism. And in fact, there are even other genetic systems that are not quite as well understood, but just that seem to even provide uh, molecular identities down to the level of synapses called neurexins. And, you know, just taken together, what, what this shows is that really the, the, this problem of idiosyncratic and stochastic genetic uh, identity corresponding with spatial patterns uh, really doesn't end um, with immunology. It really goes uh, far beyond that. Okay, So this is where DNA microscopy comes in. And in talking about DNA microscopy, I think it's useful to introduce it as a form of bio, as a modality in of itself of, of, of biological imaging. And, uh, and it's important to just kind of review what I mean by a modality of biological imaging. So the first modality is something that we should all be very familiar with, which is uh, the use of electromagnetic waves to interrogate specimens. So this is certainly uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, is an umbrella term that would uh, take into account things like light microscopy, definitely electron microscopy, even MRI. And there we're using information about sort of the way in which waves either interact with or are emitted by matter to basically interrogate the underlying structure of matter. The second way of, uh, of, of imaging within biology, we could, we could basically call imaging on contact. You, if you imagine just closing your eyes and, and taking a scalpel to a sample and, and cutting out little pieces of the sample, as long as we know where we're cutting on the sample and we can analyze the little bits that we've cut uh, out afterward, 
um, we're able to basically generate some uh, meaningful uh, uh, physical image of, of the sample. And so we, we'll call that another modality. So DNA microscopy is what I would say is the third imaging modality uh, within this framework of, of biological imaging. And DNA microscopy basically allows you to Im get the sample to image itself. And what I mean by that is that the goal of DNA microscopy is to get individual molecules within a sample to communicate with one another and generate sufficient information about their proximities so that you can actually reconstruct an image de novo from those proximity data points. Um, okay, so it's important to emphasize that this is not the first time that uh, position inference has been done from pairwise data. Um, it was all the, all the way back in the early 20th century when two mathematicians, Young and Householder, sh uh, showed that if you had comprehensive information about every single pairwise distance between individual points with one another, that you could perfectly reconstruct distances as long as the points were situated in a low dimensional space. Um, but more recently, the question has come up, uh, well, what if you don't have comprehensive information about uh, every single pairwise uh, 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 distance? What if instead, uh, what you have is just a limited range. And certainly this is important if you're trying to triangulate the positions of cell phones or cell phone towers within a network. And so in the past couple of decades, especially there has been a lot of work in trying to basically develop algorithms that specifically use this sparse data case. And, and so uh, these particular figures are from a paper from Amit Singer back in 2008, in which he asked if I only have uh, pairwise distance data uh, about very local uh, uh, you know, sectors of, uh, of the map of the United States regarding individual U.S. cities, uh, can I reconstruct uh, the entire map of the U.S.? And it turns out that you can, even when you uh, introduce noise into the system. And, and the basic mechanism by which you, you, you achieve this is by uh, basically performing this, uh, the, the previous method, multi, uh, multidimensional scaling on local domains and basically stitching those solutions together. So DNA microscopy builds on these types of observations, uh, but makes a few important conceptual swaps. So instead of talking about transmitters and receivers, we'll instead be talking about DNA and RNA molecules. Uh, second, instead of talking about broadcasting radio signals, we'll be talking about DNA amplification. So the image to keep in mind is you'll superpose sort of the image of a transmitter that's emitting radio signals outward with a DNA molecule that's duplicating itself by means of DNA amplification and generating copies of itself that are then emanating outward radially. And then finally, we're going to make a, a more subtle conceptual swap, which is, which is supplanting distance data with nearness data. What I mean by that is that we're going to have a lot of information about uh, whether or not two points are very close together or a little bit close together, but we won't have as much data on whether two, two points are a little bit far apart versus a lot far apart. Okay, so that's just a, a, a minor distinction. Okay, so with that in mind, it's possible for us to go to the actual experiment. Um, and uh, what we're going to start out with is, in this case, a very kind of cartoonish uh, picture of, of, of how the experiment works, uh, where we're going to have, let's just imagine that what we've already done is we've taken a sample and we've fixed and permeabilized it so we can get reagents in. So the sample is dead, but uh, all of the molecules are going to remain in place. And what we'll do is we'll tag individual biomolecules with these things called unique molecular identifiers, or UMIs. And what UMIs are, are just random sequences of DNA uh, that, uh, that basically are of a sufficient length so that the potential diversity of these things in solution is astronomically large. So in reality, this is just going to be uh, around 20 to 25 bases of, of, of completely randomized uh, DNA. And you can imagine that 20 bases of DNA uh, has because every single point has a potential of four letters to, to occupy it, the potential diversity is four to the 20th, or roughly a trillion, so that's very, very large. Um, in reality, you can't assume that it's a full trillion uh, uh, distinct sequences that you're actually accessing, but just that as long as that number is much, much larger than uh, the number of molecules that you're tagging, you can be pretty sure that when one of these UMIs tags one molecule, no other molecule in the rest of the sample gets that same UMI. And what's important to emphasize is that we'll also, we'll be talking exclusively, at least the experimental data I'll be showing you, will just be for RNA molecules. But again, this could be any biomolecule. It could be DNA. It could be proteins that are, are targeted with antibodies that are themselves labeled with DNA or RNA. And so it can really be anything as long as you can encode information about the identity of that molecule using DNA. And uh, another minor point that it's important to bring up at this point, um, and, and the importance will become clear later, is that there will be two different types of molecules that we'll be tagging, one of which we'll call beacons, 
uh, and the other which we'll call targets. Uh, beacons, in this case, are going to be uh, ubiquitously expressed genes. Uh, we'll, we'll just choose beta-actin, the cytoskeletal protein, as, uh, as our choice for beacons in, this ex in these experiments. Um, they're ubiquitously expressed genes whose sequence we're not interested in, but just that we're going to use them as basically locators relative to other uh, molecules, namely the targets that we're going to actually fully sequence. And so those are the ones for which you know, there might be an endogenous sequence that we're actually interested in. And we're going to get that data. And we're going to be getting targets to communicate with beacons. But beacons will not communicate with other beacons. And targets will not communicate with other targets. And so that's just a technical remark. But its importance will become clear soon. So all right, so we've started out with this tagged sample where every single molecule gets its own DNA sequence. And again, this is entirely by pipetting, so there's no specialized equipment involved because we're just randomly tagging every single molecule with a, a random DNA sequence. And now what we're going to do is we're going to start amplifying the sample using PCR, uh, just the means by which one normally goes about amplifying DNA. And at every single cycle within the PCR, within the PCR process, the number of copies of DNA roughly doubles. And, um, for those of you who not, are not familiar, PCR happens using these little primers, uh, these little fragments of DNA that anneal to different parts of, of, of the DNA sequence and allow for a kind of uh, synthesis, synthesis of different strands of DNA in different directions. And that allows for uh, this, uh, this amplification process to take place. And so the amplification process will both uh, perform the actual doubling of, of the DNA at every cycle, but it will also introduce uh, what we'll call uh, overlap extension adapters. And, and, and these uh, adapters, which are themselves DNA sequences, are going to allow for individual monomeric subunits of this reaction to concatenate to one another. And so at the very end of the reaction, rather than just having UMI transcript in this case, we'll have UMI transcript, UMI transcript, all on one molecule. And this will be entirely uh, just through the normal process of a chemical reaction. So again, no specialized equipment involved here either. And one of the more important points here is that as part of the process of concatenation, we'll wind up introducing new randomized nucleotides at the junction between these monomeric subunits. And the way in which we'll do that is by introducing randomized nucleotides into the primers themselves so that every single time a primer primes one end of this monomeric subunit, it will introduce a new set of randomized nucleotides. But when a concatenation event happens, the randomized nucleotides that previously were inserted into the corresponding subunits will get fixed into the middle of the newly formed dimeric sequence. And that new sequence will wind up getting amplified along with all the rest of the products. And so now what we'll have done is we'll have uniquely encoded an individual concatenation event into the DNA sequencing product of the reaction. So we'll call these unique event identifiers, or UEIs. And so it's important to emphasize that every single one of these is basically an independent event. So we're, we're making statistical samplings that are independent of one another. And again, we're going to be able to back all of that out uh, from, the, uh, from, from the final DNA product of the reaction. So this is a bird's eye view of what's going on here. We have these UMIs, and they're amplifying, and they're generating diffusion clouds of copies of themselves in space in the fixed sample. And these diffusion clouds will start to overlap. And at the regions that are overlapping the greatest, we'll ob observe more UEIs form. And at the areas where there will be less overlap, we'll, we'll observe fewer U UEIs forming. Okay? And at the very end, we're going to finally grind up the sample. And so up until now, the sample has been fixed. We're going to grind up the sample and throw all of the UEI products into a very large matrix. And so in this case, we're looking at just three beacons by three targets. In reality, it's going to be hundreds of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, but by hundreds of thousands, if not millions by millions. And then uh, the underlying goal of DNA microscopy is to take this data and then ask whether or not it's possible for us to model the physics of the reaction sufficiently so that we can then infer the positions of the original molecules. Yeah? Are you getting UEIs between different cells, or are they all within an individual cell? It's between everything with everything else. So, so the intent is for it to be as, quote unquote, messy as possible. Yeah. I see. And so, but the majority of the UEIs would be within a single cell. Yes, 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 yes. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, so just reiterating, right, so, 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 so the main point is to go from this matrix then uh, as part of an inverse problem to back out the original positions of the molecules. And the most important point here is that we'll be getting all the genetic information, all the stuff that we amplified, for free. Right? The genetic information isn't even relevant to the underlying estimation. It's just coming along for the ride. 
That, that's right. That's right. Uh, I mean, it, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's important to right. It, obviously, it's important for molecules to co-localize to the extent that there will actually be reactions happening, right? But just that uh, beyond. So, so if you had just a, a UMI out in the middle of space, you wouldn't see it, right? Oh yeah, sure. I, I, well, at the level of the chemistry, I guess it's perfectly fair. I, 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 I didn't include anything on that in these slides. Uh, it, it's primarily for, for practical purposes, mainly because of the read length uh, that you're confined to on the two ends, basically. What's nice here is that if you only need to read the, uh, the uh, endogenous or, or sort of the, uh, the, the gene sequence of one of these sides, then you can get very high quality sequence information from both, in this case, the beacon and the UEI, and meanwhile read from the other direction from the target UEI, UMI all the way through uh, to what you're interested in biologically. And so it's, it's primarily for the stand, from the standpoint of, of just that technical advantage. Uh, however, there's also something to be said about the fact that you don't have to waste any sequencing on self-self reaction, for example, that's, that's, that, which, which is a minor, you know, uh, aside, you know, right? So, so, you, so you don't have to worry about you know a particular molecule winding up to so efficiently concatenate to itself that you wind up wasting tons of sequencing data on just that. All right. Okay. So, uh, so now we want to actually look at what it's entailed by by uh, inferring an image from from data like this, and um, uh, the way to think about this at, in, in kind of a general way is that you know here we're we're, we're kind of given a probabilistic uh, reaction, uh, one that's generating these UEIs, these unique event identifiers, probabilistically in a way that basically makes it so that every single time that we measure a UEI, we're basically performing a statistical sample on a, an ensemble that's defined by the overlaps between individual diffusion clouds. And so in this kind of cute analogy, we can talk about this in terms of the basic probability of, of, of flipping a coin. And the main, the main important point is that the probability of getting any outcome will be, will be dependent on the size of the overlap between these uh, in UMI diffusion clouds. And basically, what we're going to be keeping track of as we collect UEIs is the number of times that we observe individual outcomes. And so we can imagine generating the first UEI. We might end up getting the tails in this case, the correspondence between UMIs two and three. We generate another UEI. Perhaps it's the same event. UEI three, UEI and, and UEI to n, and so we can see that you know really what we're doing is we're just collecting sort of a statistical sampling of discrete events. Obviously, the number of possible outcomes will be far larger than two, but just that this just emphasizes the point that we're getting a statistical sampling of a process that is at some level controlled by the distance between individual UMI molecules. And so, if we want to mathematize this a little bit more, we can start to model this and. The, simple model that, the simplest model that we can imagine really attributing to this would be an isotropic diffusion model in which the diffusion overlap is controlled by, by basically a, a diffusion kernel. Um, and, um, and these will in turn be the UEI reaction rates. And we can just plug that into what would just otherwise be a multinomial expression for probability because again, the UEI formations are independent. And so we can multiply their probabilities. And the point is that the probabilities are in turn functions of the original positions of the molecules. And so as part of the process of making an estimate, what we we'll want to do is just maximize this probability. We want to ask what is the most likely set of data, or rather what is the most likely set of positions that would give us the data that we observe. And, and, and that we'll get by simply maximizing that expression. And so from a just more kind of bird's eye view, what really what we're looking at is just kind of a hill climbing operation where we're trying to basically climb the uh, the, the landscape of probabilities so that we're rearranging the, uh, the positions of the original UMIs so that uh, we find uh, sort of a solution that's, uh, that's maximally compatible with, with, the data, with the UEI data that we observe. All right, so it's important to emphasize why it is that this problem is actually kind of difficult. Um, and it's primarily because uh, calculating the likelihood of a set of positions given the data is a function of all the UEIs that we do observe because the UEIs that we do observe tells us how close to put UMIs together. But it's also a function of all the UEIs that we haven't observed, because all the UEIs that haven't, we haven't observed tell us how far apart we need to put the UMIs from one another. And so it's that spacing problem that's, that, that's, that's ultimately uh, you know, the main challenge here, primarily because if we want to actually perform that type of calculation, um, it's basically, it will scale as the square of the number of molecules, right? Because we have to compare every single molecule's position to every single other molecule's position. And it turns out that 
certainly over the past few decades, there have been a number of methods that have been developed uh, specifically aimed at getting this particular problem, especially when it comes to Gaussian couplings, to scale uh, linearly with the number of molecules. Um, but these methods have a, a little bit of a drawback here, which is that as you increase the spatial volume that's occupied by the points uh, that you're trying to compute pairwise interactions between, um, it also scales with uh, that volume. And so, um, <clears throat> so if you double the number of molecules and double the volume of the sample, you'll, you'll wind up increasing the, uh, complex, the time complexity effectively by a factor of four. And so as part of this work, and I'm not going to go into this, although I'm happy to do it in, in discussions, is that, uh, uh, that, I, that I wound up implementing a version of this that basically makes you, allows you to make use of the fast Fourier transform to basically uh, increase the, spe the, the, the speed of this uh, process enormously. So instead of these two factors multiplying, they instead add. And so that basically makes it so that the, you're, you're not penalized uh, as much, at least, by the, uh, uh, by the existence of a very, very large volume of points that you're trying to perform this, this, uh, this, uh, this summation on. And just to give you some ideas to what the actual cost of these things are and why it's important, if I wanted to do, perform basically a gradient descent on, on the probability I showed you before, and I wanted to do it directly, that would be basically a one CPU year. A fast, the fast Gauss transform, as uh, traditionally applied, would take roughly one CPU day. And uh, what I'm tentatively calling the fast Fourier, trans, the fast Fourier Gauss transform uh, takes roughly one CPU hour. So let's look at a simulation as to how this might work. So, in this case, we're looking at points that are just given. We're going to assign a diffusion length scale within the data set. And what we're going to do is we're just going to perform gradient descent on the functional that I showed you before. And what we get is actually a pretty good recapitulation of the image, provided that we have 100 UEIs per UMI. Um, but it turns out that really this is not, it's not good to assume that we'll always have this much data for every single UMI. And it turns out that if we downsample to the point that we only have 10 UEIs per UMI, uh, this starts to get a bit blurrier, um, not surprisingly. Uh, and basically the question is, well, perhaps we can do a bit better than that, in particular because we know something about the structure of the matrix, and we also know something about the way in which diffusion process might affect the structure of the matrix. And uh, so it turns out that it, what, if, what happens if instead of, of, of looking at every single UMI individually, we instead perform an eigenvector decomposition of this matrix and use the individual eigenvectors, specifically the top eigenvectors of this matrix, as the underlying variables that we're trying to optimize instead of the individual UMIs. And it turns out we do a bit better. And it turns out you can actually keep improving this if you just apply certain normalization strategies to, uh, to this matrix. And, um, and what's really nice about this is that it tells us that there's, in fact, underlying structure to the matrix that allows us to actually denoise it significantly. And so you can kind of think about this as sort of a low-pass filter for the data in a way that actually really improves the sharpness of the image that you get out, even with minimal data. So now it's time to look at some actual data that's generated from real experiment. And, um, and really what we're usually tasked with when, when, when we look at a, a sequencing data set is we have to understand uh, the, the way in which our, our, our process of performing measurements is affecting uh, the underlying result. And uh, so what you're looking at here is basically a plot where we're, looking, we're, we're down sampling more and more reads. So we're just paying more money and getting more data. Um, and on the y-axis, you're looking at the number of UMIs or UEIs that are observed at, at every single uh, incremental uh, read depth. And what we're doing as we're accruing this stuff is basically taking the UMIs and UEIs and plugging it into our matrix. And the UMIs will form the rows and columns of the matrix. And the matrix uh, and, and, and the UEIs will form the matrix elements. And uh, the UMIs are, are beginning to saturate, uh, not completely, but, but they're getting there. And uh, the UEIs do not saturate, at least in this particular experiment. And it's important to emphasize that that's OK, because what that's telling us is that the matrix itself will converge in its size. However, as we sequence deeper and deeper, we're getting more and more information about the non-zero elements of the UEI matrix. All right. So let's take a look at what the actual uh, data tells us about the structure of, uh, of a biological sample. So in this particular experiment, we're going to be looking at uh, green fluorescent protein and red fluorescent protein expressing cells that are co-cultured in a dish. And uh, what we're going to be looking for is just the co-localization of the right set of genes uh, that, we, we're, that we're interested in, namely that GFP and RFP should be mutually exclusive, but universally expressed genes, namely GAP, DH, and ACB, should be universally expressed. And so that uh, difference in, in their expression pattern will be specifically what we'll be looking for picking up as we try to resolve individual cells. And so what I'll be showing you in the next slides are 
uh, images of individual molecules that we've performed inference on, again, without any supervision, just using their rel the kind of the DNA sequencing data that we've derived from a DNA microscopy experiment. So here are, uh, here's ACTB alone. Again, every single dot here is an individual mRNA molecule. Here's GAPDH alone. Here's GFP alone. Here's RFP alone. And here's everything together. And so we can see this is exactly what we expect. And it's important to emphasize a few key points. Um, the inference algorithm, again, is unsupervised. So it does not know that genes are distinct, right? So all of this is being done without the knowledge of exactly what genes are. It doesn't know that these genes ought to have specific patterns and that, you know, that certain ones should partition one from the other and others should, uh, should, should basically be universally expressed. And it also doesn't even know that cells exist. So you could go into this data not knowing that cells exist and discover the fact that cells exist purely from the DNA sequencing alone. And yet it's able to figure all of this out. So again, you know, this is without, uh, without any supervision. And now because, of course, the genetic data has come along for free, you can go into every individual point and ask, OK, what is that sequence? And you can know what that sequence is down to individual nucleotides. If there's an RNA editing event, if there's a, if it's, there's a stochastic splicing event, you'll know that uh, basically just by querying the individual points. And you can even go about segmenting it. What's cool about this image isn't necessarily the quali quality of the segmentation, but just the point that this is actually just using matrix algebra. So it's just performing sort of spectral segmentation using um, uh, the, the cut of, uh, of, uh, of, of minimum conductance uh, uh, operating on, uh, on the raw UEI matrix. And you actually get cells out of that. And just emphasizes just how much data is actually in the raw data set to begin with. So what we want to be able to do, of course, is to benchmark this using optical uh, optical microscopy. And so as part of this, what I uh, had to do was develop kind of a simple low-tech uh, uh, reaction chamber that uh, basically involved putting PDMS polymer on a glass slide and plasma bonding to it, and, and also uh, introducing large amounts of mineral oil into the PDMS so that uh, it would be possible to minimize the amount of evaporation that would happen during the course of the experiment. And then using this low-tech setup, it's possible to then get a very small group of cells to just play it at the bottom of one of these plates, uh, one of these wells here. And so you can see that you have like a little pipette tip with some parafilm on top. And so that allows you to get this little localized pattern down here of these cells. And um, what we're going to do is perform the DNA microscopy experiment on it. Not surprisingly, because it's a much smaller sample, we're able to get both of these curves, both the UMIs and the UEIs, to saturate pretty well. Um, obviously, that's not always going to happen if we have a very, very large sample, but nevertheless, it's impressive. And finally, we can perform the inference. And what's quite nice about this is that it actually recapitulates it quite well. Granted, it's a little bit blurry. It has a lot to do with the evaporation rate of the reaction chamber. Um, however, uh, the important thing to point out is that, you know, that, that, that these structures are, again, recapitulated quite well. In fact, to the point that you, know, you, can, you can get kind of the outline, you can get individual uh, little cell structures. I'm not sure how well you can see it, uh, but just that you know, these cell, three cells here, these three cells here, this guy down here, the, these guys up here, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you, again, the important point to emphasize here is that this is completely unsupervised. So there's no information from this optical microscopy image that's going into the inference of this DNA microscopy image. It's just entirely using the DNA microscopy data and then just taking the Im inference uh, 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 image, inferred image, and then just rotating it and rescaling it. There's not even a change in the aspect ratio that's needed in order to, in, in, in order to match it. And so that's, that it, it just really emphasizes that, in fact, we're, we're getting real, real spatial data. And what's also nice about this, of course, is that you can go into individual points and you can ask, you know, how well am I doing sequencing-wise? And you're getting, again, down to the nucleotide level, you're getting roughly 10 to the minus 3 errors per base per molecule. And that's pretty high quality over, overall. And you're getting it out to you know, really as far as you, as you want to sequence. Um, you know, if you have a you know, good sequencer that's able to sequence further than 100 bases, then you know, that's, that's fine. You're, you're going to get all of that, that long range information from an individual molecule. All right, so it's important to make a, a brief remark on, on resolution limits. So what's quite nice about um, the M microscopy is that it actually bears a very interesting analogy to uh, super resolution light microscopy. So in super resolution light, light microscopy, for those not familiar, uh, basically you're faced with a fundamental physical limit of resolution, which is the wavelength of light. And um, the main fundamental insight uh, for uh, super resolution microscopy is that if you can detect individual photons that are hitting a photodetector, then you can progressively uh, narrow down the uncertainty of, the, uh, of, of whatever points you're looking at. Um, and uh, or namely, in this case, uh, fluorescent molecules. And um, 
the underlying idea is that you know, when, when you look at an, in, an individual fluorescent molecule under a microscope or under a light micros microscope, you, you observe what's called a point spread function. So something called an array disk, which is basically has a fundamental uh, width to it, which is characterized by the wavelength of light. And as you detect more and more photons, you're going to be able to resolve better and better what the centroid of that point spread function is, and you'll be able to narrow it down increasingly. And if you're familiar with in statistics where you have, for example, a, a set of, uh, of observations and you want to determine the standard error of the mean, the standard error of the mean of, of, of a set of observations goes down as, the, as one over the square root of the number of observations that you're making, and the underlying mathematics is effectively the same here, right? So the, the, so, so the resolution goes down as, as the one over the square root of the number of photons that you detect. In DNA microscopy, what you're also looking at in this case is also a point spread function that instead of uh, having the wavelength of light characterize the fundamental physical length scale, instead you're looking at a diffusion length scale that's characterized by a diffusion constant and the time scale of the experiment. And uh, ultimately, what you're interested in is trying to narrow down that point spread function to the point that you're identifying the centroid that belongs to that diffusion cloud. And that is basically the same mathematics. And, and so instead of having the number of photons reduce the uh, standard error that you're, that, that, you're, uh, that you're observing, instead you have the number of UEIs that you're observing within the DNA microscopy experiment. And what's kind of cool about that is that you can then kind of in, in, in a more formal way, way, say that the UEIs constitute a DNA equivalent of the photon. Yeah? Um, in your analogy, how do those two terms, the numerator and the denominator, scale with the number of uh, amplification around the figure? Well, that will factor into the time scale, right, more directly. But I mean, it turns out that it's, it's not a perfectly linear correspondence because just like any reaction, eventually it kind of slows down with time. Uh, basically, eventually the uh, you know, the reagents will, will wind up getting exhausted in, some, in one way or another. And so uh, th there will be kind of a saturating effect uh, that, that makes it so that you can't ne necessarily de novo predict um, exactly what T is relative to the time of the experiment, but just that it will, you know, but it will correspond to that level. Yeah. But I mean, I mean ultimately, right, so, um, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are other things to say about it in terms of the number, the way in which the number of cycles might uh, create a deviation of the point spread function from a purely Gaussian approximation. Um, which is again, you know, our model. But so the thing to keep in mind there is that at every single incremental, right, you know, really what you're looking at is a superposition of, of, of Gaussians of increasing amplitude. And what the point is that, you know, eventually, I mean, at least you know, if you, if you model this, you know, the, 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 the number of, you know, the, the kind of the, the the Gaussians with the highest amplitude will wind up do dominating over the Gaussians with the previous amplitude. And so you can mostly sort of, you know, appro approximate it that way. Yeah. Okay. So you can also go beyond that. And what's nice about using the uh, kind of the, the sort of definition of, of uncertainty is that you're then able to sort of, in a more proper way, define a likelihood surface over the entire sample of, of, of where molecules lie. And what this is is uh, just a visualization of of, of likelihood uh, likelihoods belonging to individual molecules that are just superimposed on one another to create uh, kind of a surface that you can better see the way in which. Uh, cells sort of partition in space. And what's nice about this also is that you can use this information to improve upon the segmentation that I showed you earlier, which was just using the raw uh, UEI matrix. Uh, one of the things that we're working on continuously and that um, uh, you know, uh, is, is, is a project that's not finished yet, but just that uh, is important to emphasize is that uh, we've also been able to extend this to whole transcriptomes. What's nice about this is that we don't need to know what we're looking for ahead of time. We can basically prime from the poly A tails of uh, of mRNA molecules and basically generate uh, data sets from the entire transcriptome. Again, we have you know, single nucleotide resolution. And this is uh, work that's being done with uh, a research associate uh, who's here, Andrew Piacitelli. Um, and you can see that, you know, that, that in fact, you know, we're also getting very good uh, spatial segmentation in this way, but it's a work in progress. Um, and another part of this is also to improve the overall flow of the experiment. We're currently at a point where we can go from, a, from fixed sample to, uh, to DNA sequencing library in around two and a half days. What we're working on right now is trying to also streamline this process so that we can basically do more of a plug and play where you know, this can be uh, just sort of a uh, you know, set of reagents that are thawed from the freezer and just applied to a, a sample and, and, and so that we can grind through these things more quickly. And so the goal is to be able to get it from sample to library in around a day. Yeah. So kind of a technical question related to the diffusion that you mentioned. Uh -huh. How do you get your reagents to diffuse in but have the molecules not just diffuse around? OK, so it depends on what you mean by all right. So first of all, the reagents themselves are actually much, much smaller than the things that we're looking at uh, when it comes to uh, kind of the, the actual 
experiment, right? So, so the, the actual amplification reaction. So, so primers are, are, are very, very small molecules, whereas we're amplifying much, much larger molecules. Um, but more generally, uh, one of the things that I certainly glossed over in the description of the experiment is that we're also introducing a, uh, something called a PEG hydrogel um, uh, during the last stages of the experiment. What's nice about the PEG hydrogel is that it's non-toxic and you can deploy it easily. It turns out that you know, there are other disadvantages owing to sample variability and that type of thing, but, uh, or lot variability between the uh, uh, lots, but just that as long as you can standardize it, you're pretty safe. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, so the hydrogel is what, what's really tasked with uh, controlling the diffusion more exactly. So um, it's important to emphasize what DNA microscopy's unique capabilities are right now. Um, so right now, uh, DNA microscopy uh, can perform high, which is to say you know, roughly 99.7 to 99.9% uh, per base per accuracy sequencing over long read lengths at single cell resolution in a single idiosyncratic specimen. There are other methods out there, certainly, that can do subsets of these. Uh, but at the moment, at least, DNA microscopy is the only published method that uh, can do all these together. Uh, the second piece of this, which is entirely independent, is that DNA microscopy does all this without specialized equipment, which is, of course, relevant for the standpoint of deployability. There are, however, challenges. I mentioned one just before about the PEG hydrogel, one of which is standardization. This is uh, sort of uh, just demonstrating the fact that it's important to keep track of suppliers and lots. There are, in fact, variabilities between them. A lot of it goes to the fact that certain reagents, for example, come packed with additional uh, salts that you want to get rid of before uh, uh, b before applying them in a reaction, and certain suppliers are better than others at, uh, at, at getting rid of these salts. Uh, the other uh, uh, challenge is empty space. Uh, and, and so really, we're, we're optimally op operating in those cases where, uh, where, where molecules are very close together, which is, of course, certainly the case with tissue and, um, and, and you know, in similar cases in biology. But just that if there's a very, very large gap, for example, between two different segments of a sample, it will be very difficult to reconstruct uh, kind of that, that distance between those two different segments of the sample. However, there are other future advantages, which none of this should distract from. Uh, in particular, because DNA microscopy is intrinsically volumetric, because it's a chemical reaction, it's particularly conducive to three-dimensional imaging. Um, another point is that because we're looking at diffusional impedances rather than optical impedances, it's kind of a, it's, it's a useful thing to note that we're, we're much more faithfully looking at the cell's view of biology, what a cell sees, which is the things that are diffusing to it. And the final thing is that because, again, we're not using specialized equipment, everything can be done by multi-channel pipette. And so to a great degree, it's conducive to massive par parallelism. And so you can imagine that if there are large sets of experimental conditions that need to be applied to individual biological samples, that this then basically provides a way uh, to do that in a way that doesn't increase, for example, the cost of the experiment. And more recently, um, with my colleague Ben Holmes, uh, uh, we've been working on developing a spatial genetic browser that will allow us to perform simple navigation across large samples, um, you know, on, you know, on, on the order of a million molecules or more. Um, this is a, a little kind of uh, a screenshot video of uh, the alpha version of this browser that we've uh, been developing. Um, I don't know if you can see much there, but it's just that the point is that uh, you know you can kind of go in and basically query individual molecules within the DNA microscopy data set, be able to query individual sequences, and the goal here is to be able to allow for sort of very quick uh, interrogation of, of the entire data sets um, without having to kind of dig into uh, the raw data uh, too much. And so this kind of also allows kind of cell views and, and to be able to analyze each of those individually. Um, and then finally, the goal with a lot of this is to be able to add on uh, ways to perform statistical visualizations on top of this, this within the same module. And so we'd like to be able to perform the, the usual types of single cell genomics uh, 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 representations that we're already familiar with in, in purely single cell data, um, but again, do that with the spatial dimensions added. And so with that, uh, I'll make my acknowledgments. Uh, my mentor is Feng Zhang and Aviv Regev. Uh, process engineering of the total transcriptome uh, experiments uh, uh, were uh, Andrew Pacitelli, uh, who's here in the audience, uh, the spatial genetic browser, uh, Ben Holmes, who uh, at least was here, who, who was here and, um, uh, and very, very, uh, uh, very helpful support and conversations by, uh, uh, with, uh, with the members of the Regev lab, the Zhang lab, and the Blaney lab. And uh, any more questions, I'd be happy to take.